We have come to the last part of the General Conference Administration Seminar. We have covered on Wednesday the issue about diet and the importance of diet and especially reformation in diet that we need. On Thursday evening we talked about the Christian family. The family is the foundation of society. It's the foundation of the church. And this is why it's so important for us to talk a little bit about the family and the importance of a lifelong tie. On Friday evening, we had a chance to talk a little bit about the Sabbath and especially how to keep the Sabbath according to the commandment. On Sabbath, we talked about the importance of our relationship with God and being separated from the world. Now, you know, when we look at these topics about standards, a lot of these topics have to do with standards. And we talk about standards in relationship to the kingdom of heaven. And so many times we think, well, we have too many rules. We have so many rules on the way to the kingdom of heaven. Why is it that we have so many rules? Sometimes even we think, oh, the reform movement, we have too many rules. We need to understand an important principle when we're talking about the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, it talks a little bit about the road to the kingdom of heaven. It says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. We find here that the road to the kingdom of heaven is a narrow way. The gate to enter into eternal life is a narrow gate. Yeah, and sometimes when we look at that, we, we get frustrated because, you know, so many times we when we talk about rules, we talk about thou shall not. Even the Ten Commandments are thou shall not do this and thou shall not do that. So why do we speak about the narrow way? Why do we talk about thou shalt not? In the book, Our High Calling, page 8, it says, There never was a more solemn time in the history of the world than the time in which we are now living. Our eternal interests are at stake, and we should arouse to the importance of making our calling and election sure. We dare not risk our eternal interests on mere probabilities. When we're talking about the road to the kingdom of heaven, we need to be certain of the road in which we're living in. And especially now as we're beginning a new year, we want to be sure that we are on the right track, that we are on the right road. And yes, it is called a narrow road. It goes on, we must be in earnest. What we are, what we are doing, what is to be our course of action in the future are all questions of untold moment. And we cannot afford to be listless, indifferent, unconcerned. It becomes each one of us to inquire, what is eternity to me? Are our feet in the path that leads to heaven or in the broad road that leads to perdition? Yes, we need to think about this as we begin a new year. We talk about New Year's resolutions. But in reality, are we not just making resolutions for this world, for temporal things? Are we making certain that we are on the road to the kingdom of heaven. How valuable is eternity to you? Do you have eternity as something of great value? Or is it something of little value? So when we're talking about this road to the kingdom of heaven, yes, this narrow road, is that road hard or easy? Of course, when we think about the restrictions, so many restrictions, do restrictions make things hard or easy? Let's talk a little bit about that. You know, let's talk a little bit about these restrictions. I think of restrictions, I, I think of the first restriction placed after the Garden of Eden to Cain and Abel. 
And how did Cain relate to a simple restriction? I mean, it was not that complicated. You're bringing an offering to the altar of God, and God says, bring a lamb. And Cain decided to bring something else. He didn't want to go get a lamb. And how did he react to such restrictions? In Genesis 4, verse 5 and 6, it says, But unto Cain and his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wrath, and why is thy countenance fallen? So here they brought an offering, and God did not accept the offering that Cain gave. And what happened? His demeanor changed. His countenance fell and he became very angry. Why does he get angry? Why is it that sometimes we get angry? We want something and especially when there's a restriction of some sort, we get angry. Why is that? John 3 verse 19 tells us, And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world, And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Why is it that we gravitate towards darkness? Well, we would gravitate toward darkness if we want to do evil deeds. And then as soon as a restriction is placed, we get quite upset. In Steps to Christ on page 111, it says, The teachings and restrictions of God's word are not welcome to the proud, sin-loving heart. And those who are unwilling to obey its requirements are ready to doubt its authority. So here we find that if the heart is proud and sinful, the sin-loving heart, then the restrictions are not welcomed. Yeah, and then what else do we do? We then begin to doubt the authority of the Word of God. We doubt the spirit of prophecy. We begin doubting the Bible, and then we go on in that direction. Why? Because the heart is not changed. Now, how does Satan work on this whole process? How does he uh, take us from the road to the kingdom of heaven to destruction? 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 19. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. So how does Satan work to us? How does he get us off the narrow way? Well, he promises us liberty. Yeah, he promises us freedom. If you do this, you will have freedom. You can do whatever you want to do. And then you think you can do whatever you want to do. And guess what? Next thing you find is that you're a slave. Yeah, he brings you into bondage by promising liberty. In Bible Commentary, Volume 4, 11, 62, he denounced the divine statutes as a restriction of their liberty and declared that it was his purpose to secure the abolition of law. Yeah, get rid of the law. Why? So that you can have freedom. So that you can have liberty. That's what Satan began with right in this world. When actually in the universe, that's how sin came in. Promising no restrictions. Promising liberty. Promising freedom. And then of course you know what happened as a result. The natural heart does not like restrictions does not like reproof because when there is restrictions, there has to be reproof. In Proverbs 9 verse 8, it says, Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Yeah, so if you give him reproof, he ends up hating. So when we talk about the rebellion of Satan, what does Satan say was the cause of his rebellion? Great Controversy, page 500. And having succeeded thus far, He declared that God's unjust restrictions had led to man's fall as they had led to his own rebellion. So Satan states that right from the very beginning, right there from heaven and later on in this earth, that it was unjust restrictions that has caused the rebellion. And it goes on, like him, Satan, speaking of him, They seek to break down the restraints of the law of God and promise men liberty through transgression of its precepts. 
reproof of sin still arouses the spirit of hatred and resistance. Yes, reproof creates what? Hatred and resistance. And so what does Satan do? He promises people liberty. He promises them freedom. No more resistance. No more restraints. No more restrictions. Now, how should we react towards God's restrictions? We find this in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Here it says that we should not despise when God brings us chastening, when God introduces restrictions to us. Why is that? Why is it that we should not despise that? In the next verse it says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Actually, God brings us chastening. God brings us restrictions because he loves us. It's the result of love. Let's just look and see how that works. In the very beginning, God created a garden eastward in Eden. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 8 and verse 15, it says, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And verse 15, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. So we see here that God created this beautiful thing called the Garden of Eden. And this most wonderful thing God created for man. And then what did he do? He gave all these beautiful trees. You can eat all these trees. And then verse 17, it says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So here you find that God created this beautiful garden, all these wonderful different trees in that garden, and then he placed the restriction. In the book Confrontation on page 12, it says, There was a single prohibition. The forbidden tree was as attractive and lovely as any of the trees in the garden. God did not create all these wonderful trees and says you can eat only one. No, God made many, many different trees. There were so many different types of varieties. And then God says there is this one that you cannot eat from that one particular tree. And then you find Eve. She began walking through the garden one day. And uh, what was she thinking about as she was walking? She comes there, she sees this tree there. Oh, you cannot eat this tree. And then something started going in her mind. And what was that? We continue in confrontation. She was thinking of the restrictions which God had laid upon them in regard to the tree of knowledge. So here you have this woman, this first woman that God had created. She is going through the Garden of Eden and she comes to this beautiful tree, just as beautiful as all the other trees. And then she starts thinking, why was this restriction placed upon us? And oftentimes, temptations begin with this idea of restrictions. And so, when we meditate on that restriction, it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And the next thing you know, she forgot all the other trees in the garden, and she saw only this one tree. And now, why was that one tree forbidden? Why was the fruit of that one tree forbidden? It goes on in confrontation. It was called a tree of knowledge because in partaking of that tree which God had said thou shalt not eat of it, they would have a knowledge of sin and experience in disobedience. You see, God did not want them to have a knowledge of sin. God did not want them to have an experience in disobedience. And that's why God restricted that one tree. Now, why does all these things in the world come as a result of eating from that one tree, that one restriction? In Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene, page 44, 
It seemed a small matter to our first parents to transgress the command of God in that one act, the eating from a tree that was so beautiful to the sight and so pleasant to the taste, but it broke their allegiance to God and opened the gates to a flood of guilt and woe that has deluged the world. So what happened as a result of eating from this one tree, that one restriction? Well, number one, it broke our allegiance to God. Yeah, that was a symbol of allegiance to God, and it broke allegiance to God. And what happened? It opened the gates of a flood of guilt and woe that has deluged the world. Yes, what is this world suffering from? This world today is suffering from guilt. Yeah, the more they're bringing in laws that you can do this sin, you can do that sin, and more and more things that were considered sinful even 10, 20 years ago are now considered normal. And what does it do? It's not helping people anymore. It's not giving them liberty. It's bringing them guilt. And yeah, that's the thing that the flood of guilt has entered into this world. So let us talk a little bit about the purpose of restrictions. Yeah, why does God place restrictions? And we're going to take a look at one particular example here. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 16 and verse 15, where it talks about what God gave to the children of Israel after they left Egypt. It says, And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. So when they went into the wilderness, they ran out of food after a few days, and God introduced them to manna. Manna was to be their diet for the rest of their sojourn in the wilderness. Now, what did that replace? In Exodus 16, verse 3, it says, And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full, for ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So yes, they had the flesh pots in Egypt, and now God placed a restriction upon them. He says, no more eating of flesh, and now you're going to eat something called manna. Now, what was the purpose? Why did God place a restriction upon them? I mean, God didn't have to do that. But God now says, now you are restricted. You're going to eat this kind of food, not that kind of food. Now, why did God do that? In Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene 118 to 119. Had they been willing to deny appetite in obedience to his restrictions, feebleness and disease would have been unknown among them. Their descendants would have possessed physical and mental strength. Now listen to this. What would have happened? If they accepted the restriction, feebleness and disease would have been unknown among them. Do you think that was a good restriction? Do you think this was something that was intended by God for their benefit? Or was this restriction something bad from them? Telling them you cannot have this because it's something really good and I want to keep it for myself. No, that was not it. Actually, when they accepted that restriction, of course, they didn't accept it fully. But if they would have received it fully, what would have happened? Feebleness and disease would have been unknown among them. Can you imagine right now here we're dealing with this pandemic in this last couple of years. Do you think that it would have been a wonderful thing that there is no pandemic? Do you think it's a wonderful thing that there is no sickness, that there's no need of doctors? Well, this is what would have happened if the children of Israel would have accepted this restriction that God had given to them. And not only would it have helped them physically, it goes on, they would have had clear perceptions of truth and duty, keen discrimination, and sound judgment. 
it would have affected more than their physical life. They would have been able to understand things clearly. The distinction between right and wrong would have been clearly understood by that people. Only if what? If they had accepted those restrictions. Even today, restrictions can be a benefit to us when we're talking here about diet. Notice here in Ministry of Healing 235, Intemperate eating is often the cause of sickness, and what nature most needs is to be relieved of the undue burden that has been placed upon her. In many cases of sickness, the very best remedy is for the patient to fast for a meal or two that the overworked organs of digestion may have an opportunity to rest. Can you imagine this? You know, here we're eating normally, uh, whatever our diet may be, and then we start getting sick. One of the best things to do is what? Is to not eat for a meal or two. Yeah, that, that is one of the best things that you can do. And many times when I'm traveling, and sometimes in the last several years I've been traveling internationally, sometimes you're changing day to night, sometimes you're changing one season to another season when you're going from the northern to the southern hemisphere. And your whole life gets all mixed around. And now you're supposed to be eating, but here you're going to be sleeping. And when you're supposed to be sleeping, now it's time for breakfast or lunch. Yeah, that's what happens. And what happens to your entire system? Your entire system gets messed up and you start getting sick. And I cannot afford to get sick. So what do I do? Simple. Don't eat. Yeah, miss a meal or two. And sometimes one or two days you can miss a meal. And what happens? You're placed back on track. It's called restrictions. And that restriction is a benefit to us. And notice this, it goes on. A fruit diet for a few days has often brought great relief to brain workers. Many times a short period of entire abstinence from food, followed by simple moderate eating, has led to recovery through nature's own recuperative effort. An abstemious diet for a month or two would convince many sufferers that the path of self-denial is the path of health. Yeah, changing our diet, an abstemious diet, going, even when you try it for a month or two, I mean, abstemious meaning compared to what the rest of the world is doing. Yeah, the rest of the world, what they're eating normally. And if we change to a good vegetarian diet, what happens? It seems like it's very abstemious. But if you do it for a month or two, you will see the benefits of these restrictions. But you know, sometimes restrictions can be actually bad for you. So we've been talking so far about the positive things about restrictions. But sometimes there could be negative things, especially if you go overboard. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, it says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Here it's talking about the relationship of parents to children. And we can understand this not just between parents and children, but we can understand this also through in our church relationships, between the ministry and uh, church members, between us as a church and other people that are interested in coming to visit the church. It can be in church leadership, any type of church leadership with those others. And it says here, provoke not your children to wrath, but what? Bring them up into the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So when we talk about not provoking, what is probably one of the things that creates provocation? We don't think about this sometimes, but there are things that create provocation. Let's take a look and Child Guidance 285, many parents deny the children an indulgence in that which is safe and innocent and are so afraid of encouraging them in cultivating desires for unlawful things that they will not even allow their children to have the enjoyment that children should have. Now, we often talk about something of an indulgence. We talk about it in a negative capacity. 
when we say that something is being indulged, we think of it as sinful. But here it says that many parents deny their children what? An indulgence that is safe and innocent. Why? Why do they do that? Because they are afraid of encouraging and cultivating desires that are unlawful. So to avoid this that is unlawful, let's go to the other extreme and not even allow them the enjoyments of something that children should have. It goes on, through fear of evil results, they refuse permission to indulge in some simple pleasure that would have saved the very evil they seek to avoid. And thus the children think there is no use in expecting any favor and therefore will not ask for them. Can you imagine this? They refuse some simple pleasure. Why? Because they're afraid that that simple pleasure will lead to something worse, something sinful. And so let's not even get on that road. And so we keep removing the simple pleasures and what happens? What is the result of that? Again, Child Guidance 285. But would it not be well for him to consider the fact that the first cause of his son's disobedience was his own unwillingness to indulge him in that in which there was no sin? Now, there's a lot of things that we imagine to be sinful, and they are not. And so when you forbid that which is not sinful, yeah, it's an indulgence, yes, we, we can call it an indulgence. And then what happens? That when you deny that which is not sinful, it creates the attitude of giving up. It throws their hands up in the air and saying, forget all of this. Yeah, this is the problem. This is the problem in, with children. It's a problem in the church. If we create rules, rules that are designed to keep us on the straight and narrow, yeah, rules that are more stringent than God designed, it creates this restlessness. It creates the very things that we're trying to forbid. It creates the very thing that we're trying to prevent. Now, this happened among the children of Israel. They came out of Babylonian captivity and to prevent them from Sabbath breaking, to prevent them from all these other things, they created rules. That's how the Pharisees came into existence. They created all these rules to prevent them from doing this, which was sinful. And so they forbid all these things that are innocent in and of themselves. And then they ended up doing what? creating a bunch of hypocrites. And yeah, they ended up doing even the evil, very evil of which they were trying to prevent. So how do we avoid that? How do we avoid that extreme of creating restrictions that become unmanageable? We find in Galatians 6 verse 1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So not only talking here about innocent things, but even some things in which a person does sin. What happens when a child does an infraction? What happens when someone does commit a sin in the church? Yes, an open sin. How do you treat that person? Sometimes we're so eager to deal with that sin that we forget the humanity, the Christ-like humanity that we need to share with people. And one of the first things to do here, it says, is to consider thyself lest thou also be tempted. In other words, we need to put ourselves in their place. And then what would we do if we were in that place? Would we be that severe upon ourselves or we want to be a little bit easier? Yeah, severity is a bad thing sometimes. Child Guidance 286, it says, By their severity in dealing with their errors, 
they stir up the worst passions of the human heart and leave their children with a sense of injustice and wrong. They meet in their children the very disposition that they themselves have imparted to them. Yeah, we end up creating something worse. And so here it's talking about children, and we can apply this in the church just as well, dealing with their error. So this is not something innocent. It's actually dealing with a sin, dealing with an error. And what do they do? By being so severe, what do they do? They stir up the worst passions of the human heart. Yeah, they stir something up that should never have been stirred up. And we can see this also when we're talking about the nature of God. Yeah, when we're talking about the nature of God. For example, we talk about the nature of God. When you sin, there must be a punishment. And the devil has introduced this thing called the natural immortality of the soul. And so when you're in this world and you live maybe 10, 20, 30, maybe even 90 years, suppose during those 90 years you were sinning. Yeah, suppose you were sinning the entire 90 years, became a very wicked person. Then what? Do you deserve for that 90 years the punishment of eternal ages never ending of, punish of a punishment in an eternally burning hell? Is that justice? When you end up having for 90 years, say even 100 years, and, and you're eternally burning for that 90 years, does that give you the sense of justice? Or does that bring in you a sense of injustice? Yeah, so we have to look at when we're looking at punishment for a sin or dealing with a sin, if we are too severe what does it do? It creates rebellion because any person that's sensible and sees that if God truly was going to punish you like that, that that's an unjust God. And then what do you do? It leads you to give it all up. Yeah, that's what it does. And so it says here what? They meet in their children the very disposition that they themselves have imparted to them. Yeah, by that type of an attitude, we're imparting that to our children, we're imparting that to church members, we're imparting that to people that are interested in this message. And this is why, as we begin a new year, we need to evaluate our attitude. Not just our attitude towards people who are doing good, but what about those people who have actually made mistakes, who have sinned in the church? How do we treat them? It's really important for us to treat them properly. And it goes on in Child Guidance. Such parents drive their children away from God by talking to them on religious subjects. For the Christian religion is made unattractive and even repulsive by this misrepresentation of truth. Yeah, then whenever you talk about religion to those children, what do they do? They don't want to hear it. And what happens in the church if we are too severe? Then whenever we're talking about religion, they don't want to hear. It's a natural reaction. Why? Because the Christian religion is made unattractive, and not only unattractive, it has become repulsive. Is that what we want to do? Is that our objective? You see, we need to understand that the Christian life is not just the rules. That's not what Christianity is all about. The rules are there. The restrictions are there so that we can live. The tree in the Garden of Eden, it wasn't designed that we just look at that tree and think of the restrictions. No, there was one restriction there and you were supposed to enjoy the rest of the Garden of Eden. In John chapter 10, verse 10, it says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. This is what God wants for us. He wanted it back in the Garden of Eden so they can enjoy the entire garden and not just meditate on that one restriction. The restriction was there. But that was not to consume us. We are supposed to live and we're supposed to live in abundant life. Child guidance again. When parents become old and have young children to bring up, 
The father is likely to feel that the children must follow in the sturdy, rugged path in which he himself is traveling. It is difficult for him to realize that his children are in need of having life made pleasant and happy for them by their parents. I want you to look at this statement very carefully. Yes, sometimes when you get older in life, you need to have more restrictions. Yeah, in order to survive health-wise, there's a lot more restrictions that you need to go through as you're getting older. Yeah, 10 years ago, the things I used to do 10 years ago, I can't do today. And yeah, if I have infractions on certain health things that I could do 20 years ago without even thinking, yeah, there's consequences immediately to me today. And so I have to live a stricter lifestyle. But we can't expect that that is to be for the children. We can't expect that the stricter lifestyle is to be for the youth in the church. No, there has to be an understanding. And I'm talking about things, not the sinful. We're not talking here about permitting sin all over the church. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about that there are some things that are not sin that are called indulgences that we don't need when you get older, but you need them when you're younger. Yeah, those type of things, there's nothing wrong with them. And so we need to apply this in our church relationships. And the way we're able to understand that, even when there are infractions, is the principle found in Psalm 85, verse 10. It says, mercy and truth are met together, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. We need to understand that mercy goes along with truth. Sometimes we're consumed with understanding only what is truth, that we become like Pharisees. Yeah, obviously, if you only think about mercy, then you end up like the Sadducees, okay? That's, that's the other uh, part of it. But it says both of these things are to be combined in the life experience. In Adventist Tome 309, while rules and restrictions are laid upon them, great care should be taken to show them the Christ-like side of your character and not the satanic side. Children need constant watch care and tender love. Bind them to your hearts and keep the love as well as the fear of God before them. We want our children to understand that God loves them, not just the fear of God, that God loves you. And do you know that God really loves you? Not only as a child, but as a young person, as an adult, God really loves you. God cares for you. And we as a church need to have that experience. We need to show that experience to others that we're dealing with. The two aspects, the Christ-likeness of our character, not just the issue of rules. Fathers and mothers do not control their own spirit and therefore are not fit to govern others. To restrain and caution your children is not all that is required. You have yet to learn to do justly and to love mercy as well as to walk humbly with God. So the first thing here is that we need to learn what it means to control our own spirit to learn what it means to control our own attitude, to be an example to others. And then what? Restraint and caution are necessary, but that's not everything. That's not what life is all about. You see, you have yet to learn to do what? To do justly and to love mercy. That's an equal part of this whole Christian life. You see, when we're talking about Christianity, it begins with understanding. Yes, we need to start with the understanding. John 8 verse 32 says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Knowing the truth is the beginning of it all. And keep in mind that truth is Jesus Christ. Knowing the truth is knowing Jesus Christ. Knowing why. When you understand why certain restrictions are there, what's going to happen? You're going to be able to do it much more easily. In Steps of Christ 111, in order to arrive at truth, we must have a sincere desire to know the truth and the willingness of heart to obey it. So first of all, when we're talking about knowing something, we must have a sincere desire to know the truth. It's not enough just to know it, to learn it, 
to study it like you're studying geography or history. No, you must have a real sincere desire to know the will of God and not just to have knowledge of it, but what? A willingness of heart to obey. When we do that, it changes everything. It changes our relationship to obedience. And then what? It goes on. Christ has said, if any man willeth to do his will, he shall know of the teaching. In order to know whether something's truth or not, you must have the willingness to do the will of God. If we don't have that willingness, if that attitude is not there, it becomes impossible to do that. And then it goes on. Instead of questioning and caviling concerning that which you do not understand, give heed to the light that already shines upon you and you will receive greater light. So instead of being so concerned about the things that we don't understand, we don't understand many things, but the things that you do know have a willingness to obey the things that you do know, and then what? By the grace of Christ, perform every duty that has been made plain to your understanding, and you will be enabled to understand and perform those of which you are now in doubt. So yes, yeah, some of the things that we're in doubt about right now, what do you do? Obey from a willing heart those things that you do understand. And as you do those things that you do understand, little by little, God will enable you to understand and enable you to perform those things which now you are having doubt over. That's what Christianity is about. So when we're talking about obedience, whether it's hard or easy, it has to do with a change of heart. It has to do with my change of heart. If my heart is changed and I am willing to obey the will of God, it makes a whole difference. You see, the purpose of God is not just to have an obedient people. That's not enough. To be obedient like your dog, to be obedient like your horse. That's not what God is looking for. In Deuteronomy 6, verse 5 and 6, after repeating the Ten Commandments in chapter 5, just before they entered the promised land, the next chapter, chapter 6, what does God say? And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. God wants this to be in my heart. When it's in my heart, it changes the nature of the Ten Commandments from a thou shalt not to a thou shalt. Yeah, you will do what? You will do it because you want to do it. In other words, I don't want to disobey God. I don't want to steal. I don't want to kill. I don't want to do all those things. Those are not my desires. Instead, I want to obey God. When that is in your heart, when the law is in your heart, then obedience changes. Yeah, it changes from being hard and impossible to becoming something much easier. Why? Because it's coming from your own heart. That's what God wants from us. And yeah, we're going to have some trials along the way. We're going to have to experience some restrictions along the way. And what do we do with these restrictions? What happens as a result of these restrictions? Psalm 30, verse 5. For his anger endureth but a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Yeah, weeping may endure for a night. It may be a short time that you have suffering because restrictions, let's face it, they're not always comfortable. Yeah, when you're hungry and you know that it's best not to eat something at that moment, that's called a restriction, but you feel better later on. Yeah, that's what I said at the very beginning. When I'm traveling like that and I start feeling sick, you stop eating. And yeah, you still sometimes feel hungry, especially when somebody sits there and shows you all this nice good food that they have. We have prepared this wonderful food for you. And you're looking at all that wonderful food and you know that they work so hard for it, but you say, you know what, let me just wait on that. I'll have to eat it later. I know it's better now, but I'll have to eat it later. And then what happens? Then you can go for the rest of that time without suffering sickness. And you can have an enjoyable time with people instead. The question is, do you want this kind of joy? 
Is that what you want in your life? As we begin this new year right now, do you want to have a joyful new year? In John 15, 11, it says, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. God has given these restrictions, but when these restrictions are accepted from the heart, what happens? Then your joy is full. But you don't spend all your time looking at the restrictions. No, you don't sit there and spend all your time thinking, oh, I can't do this and I can't do that. Focus on the things that you can do. There's so many things, even when we're talking about Sabbath keeping according to the commandment, there's a lot of things, yeah, that we can't do on the Sabbath, but you know what? There's much more that we can do. When you focus on the things that you can do, guess what? You don't even think about the things that you can't do. And then what happens? You end up having the joy, the joy that is full. God wants you to have this joy. And as we begin this new year, do you want to have that joy? May God help us that we may resolve in our hearts to experience that joy to the full that God wants for each and every one of us. May God bless you. Amen. Our gracious, loving Father in heaven, we're so thankful to you for your many wonderful blessings. We'd like to thank you that you care for each and every one of us. We'd like to thank you that in your mercy and kindness, you have given us this opportunity to begin another year with some important thoughts for us. Lord, we look at our failings in the past year, but Lord, we don't want to focus on them. We trust in the blood of Jesus Christ that you have cleansed our hearts and that we can begin afresh this new year. Help us to focus on the right things. Help us to especially help our children, help our young people and those young in the faith. And help us to have the heart of Jesus so that we can treat them in the right way and that we can plant their feet in the heavenly pathway. Strengthen us. Strengthen us as a church. Help us to hasten your coming. Help us to have a people ready for your kingdom. Bless us once again, we pray and thank you. And help us that many souls may be brought into a knowledge of your love and your care is our prayer in Jesus' worthy name. Amen.